talk about the lymphatic system, which may be a system you did not know you have, uh, but it's really, really important, and it's a big part of your immune system. Uh, the lymphatic system is a secondary circulatory system. It's going to remove excess fluid from your tissues. That excess interstitial fluid is called lymph once it enters into the lymphatic system. So the fluid flowing through the lymphatic system we call lymph. Interstitial fluid is the fluid around cells. It's part of the extracellular fluid. The extracellular fluid also includes the blood plasma. The interstitial fluid is just the fluid that's outside of cells not including the blood plasma. So all of the fluid that's around the cells in tissues, all of that is the interstitial fluid. And as we're gonna see, sometimes they're excess, the lymphatic system carries that excess away and then returns it to the circulatory system. It's a really important uh, part of maintaining fluid homeostasis, that is maintaining the right level of fluid in different parts of the body. The lymphatic system is going to constantly check the lymph for any foreign materials, especially possible pathogens. It's also going to help examine self cells for abnormal cells. And then it's going to initiate an immune response when it finds something either possibly pathogenic or something that doesn't belong there. And then the other big thing it has, we're going to come back to this when we do the digestive system, is that it transports fats from the digestive system back into the circulation. So fats are actually going to take a different pathway than the rest of the nutrients that come through the digestive system. And again, we'll come back to that when we do the digestive system. So here, this image shows a capillary bed with all these little green things being the lymphatic uh, capillaries. So lymphatic vessels are going to absorb excess fluid, especially around capillary beds. So if you think about the pressure in the bloodstream, remember that arterioles have very low pressure, but they do have higher pressure than the capillaries. And that helps to force the blood across the capillary bed into the venule. Because the pressure on the arterial side is higher than the pressure on the venous side, the venule side, more blood plasma exits the capillaries, then gets reabsorbed by the capillaries, which leaves excess fluid around the cells. The, cap the lymphatic capillaries are these little dead end things that absorb that fluid. Around the digestive system, they're also going to absorb lipids and lipid soluble vitamins, which can go straight through the walls of the cells in the digestive system because they're lipids. The lymphatic capillaries are these closed end vessels. Uh, they're everywhere except the red bone marrow and the central nervous system. Those parts don't have these lymphatic capillaries. They're a little larger in diameter than the capillaries, but otherwise they're very similar. They're really small and narrow. And, rem and these are just absorbing fluid. Remember, the capillaries are going to accommodate red blood cells. The meta-arterioles are going to accommodate the white blood cells. Lymphatic capillaries are just going to absorb this excess fluid that oozed out of the capillary on the arterial side of the capillary bed and then didn't get reabsorbed on the venous side of the capillary bed. The lymphatic capillaries um, merge into larger lymphatic vessels, and those lymphatic vessels have valves. Um, just like the veins, they're going to have valves that prevent the lymph from pooling backward and uh, pooling in the lower structures of the body. So here's a valve, uh, and just like with the veins, the valves are extensions of the endothelial tissue that lines the lumen of the vessel. All right, so in the GI tract, uh, the lymph is white because it's full of fats. And so the lymphatic vessels, there are lots of them. They run alongside the uh, blood vessels. So here's an artery in the mesentery. This is what the mesentery looks like. Here's, the, here's parts of the small intestine. 
And all of this white stuff, these are lymphatic vessels that are carrying fats. And they, it looks white because of the fat. Uh, and this particular uh, lymph is called chyle. Uh, so this is specifically the lymph gathered from the digestive system that's very high in fat. Now, uh, the lymphatic vessels are going to carry lymph to and through lymph nodes, which cluster around the body. Afferent vessels bring the lymph to the lymph nodes. Efferent vessels take the lymph away from those vessels. And the lymph may pass through several lymph nodes in a cluster and then get drained into a larger vessel that carries it back to the circulatory system. So on our models, um, here's our torso model that we have in the classroom. These little yellow things are the actual lymph nodes and these white things are the lymph vessels. So you can see there are a number of afferent vessels traveling into each, vessel, each lymph node and then efferent vessels carrying lymph away. And you can see that in some cases, the lymph is gonna go through a couple of different lymph nodes before returning to the circulatory system. And that help, just helps to make sure that every part of the lymph has been thoroughly checked by the lymphatic system uh, before it gets back into circulation. The lymphatic vessels drain into trunks. Uh, each trunk carries lymph from a specific part of the body. So we've got the jugular trunks that carry from the head, the subclavian from the arm, bronchomediastinal from the uh, upper part of the torso, lumbar and intestinal trunks carrying from the legs and the abdomen. The trunks dump uh, lymph into ducts, and we have two main ducts. There is the um, right lymphatic duct and the uh, thoracic duct. And then those ducts are going to dump the lymph into the circulatory system, into the subclavian veins, right where they fuse with the, um, the internal jugular veins. So that's what we're seeing here. Here's the subclavian vein here and here. There's the internal jugulars. You can see the lymphatic ducts drain there. So then all of that extra interstitial fluid gets returned to the circulatory system, gets oxygenated, and then goes back into the cir circulation. Now, at the base of the thoracic duct, the trunks uh, bringing lymph from the legs and the abdominal pelvic cavity dump into this cisterna chyle. A cistern is a, like a water tank. Chyle refers to chyle. So this is going to be a place to collect that uh, chyle and other lymph before it gets carried up through the thoracic duct. Now, because we only have two lymphatic ducts, um, they're gonna drain really specific parts of the body. The right lymphatic duct drains the right side of the head and neck, the right arm and the right upper quadrant of the uh, trunk. The thoracic duct drains the rest of the body. So much harder working, why? because that's just the way it is. Now, swelling is called edema. Uh, lymphedema is specifically swelling caused by blockage of the lymphatic system. This is what edema looks like in a pregnant woman uh, who is very close to giving birth. Um, it's sometimes caused by a result of high blood pressure, which for forces excess blood plasma out at the capillaries um, more than the lymph vessels can handle and uh, you get pooling uh, in the lower extremities in particular. Often lymphedema is caused by obstruction, sometimes caused as scar tissue from removal of the lymph nodes. Uh, the spread of malignant tumors may cause lymphedema because it uh, literally uh, scars or swells the lymph nodes. Radiation therapy to treat the malignant tumor can leave scarring that can cause lymphedema. Trauma, infection, all of those things could cause uh, swelling in the lymphatic system. So anytime you have severe swelling like this, it is a time to go to your doctor and make sure that there's nothing wrong. Now, extreme lymphedema 
uh, is called elephantiasis, uh, and that's where the legs swell enough they look like elephant legs. Uh, in certain parts of the world, there is a parasitic worm called the filarial worm. It's a little nematode worm shown here. And it infests the lymphatic system and uh, multiplies and creates blockage. And so lymphedema, extreme lymphedema, is a sign of a filarial worm infection. Uh, filarial worm infections are actually becoming much less common, partly because of the work of former President Jimmy Carter. He and his wife took on uh, eradication of filarial worms as uh, one of their causes, and they've actually uh, managed to uh, fund work that has eliminated filarial worms from part of the world. So that's becoming less common around the world. Now, um, other lymphatic structures, we have lymphs, lymph nodules and lymph nodes. And don't get those confused. Lymph nodes are really specific things. We're going to come back to those in a sec. Lymph nodules are just clusters of lymphatic cells, usually meaning white blood cells, um, with some extra cellular connective tissue kind of holding them together. And these are often found um, in areas that are exposed to the outside environment. They do have an area in the center that creates new immune cells. Um, and this is a little beyond this class, but uh, your white blood cells get made in the bone marrow, but then uh, some of those actually uh, can also, some new white blood cells get made in uh, the lymph nodules or the lymph nodes themselves in response to uh, a, an infection. So we see these lymph nodules in areas like the GI tract and the throat where um, tissue is directly exposed to the outside world and more likely to um, be exposed to a possible pathogen. So MALT, mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue, is most common in the digestive system, especially the small intestine. And we can see it. Um, here's the columnar epithelium. And then just below that, we see this granular looking um, MALT called Peyer's patches. Uh, and this is all lymphatic tissue that's monitoring all of the materials brought in across this epithelium just to check it all for foreign substances before it travels on straight into the bloodstream. Um, tonsils are another group of nodules and you can see we've got little nodules within the tonsils. They uh, are in the nasal and oral cavities and they help to protect uh, the pharynx, the nose, the mouth, the larynx, and the esophagus from infection. And it's really important because of course those tissues are directly exposed to possible pathogens from the outside environment. Uh, if you do have a cold or flu, they will become inflamed and infected. If you have a sore throat, what you're feeling is these swollen tonsils. This is tonsillitis as a result of um, strep throat, these big white patches. That's an example of a streptococcus infection. And then some people do get chronic tonsillitis, which is where rather than protecting the body from infection, the tonsils themselves become infected and uh, have to be removed. So if you do, that's what these look like these are infected tonsils that were, were removed during a tonsillectomy. These belong to a former student of mine who was like, I'm having tonsillectomy, do you want to see my tonsils? So you can see this one at least looks nice and round. This one just looks all kind of wackadoodle. Neither of these is healthy. They're supposed to be nice and smooth. The tonsils, there are three pairs of tonsils or three groups on either side. Pharyngeal tonsils are at the back of the nasopharynx. Uh, the palatine tonsils are on either side of the back of the oral cavity. And then the lingual tonsils, remember lingua means tongue, these are on the back of the tongue. You're, and there's uh, two of, there's pairs of tonsils. So there's actually six tonsils in all. So right and left for each of these. Now, we do have specific lymphatic organs, uh, which are, again, 
big areas of lymphatic tissue. The thymus gland is one of the most important. In children, it's largest, in infants and children, it sits on top of the heart, and it's the site where white blood cells mature. So a lot of white blood cells made in the bone marrow travel to the thymus and then finally mature into their final shape and get their final uh, function. And then as adults mature and your immune system matures, the thymus gland decreases in size um, to the point that in many elderly people, it's actually gone. There's no thymus anymore. And in a lot of older people, it, their, their thymus gland just doesn't even do anything anymore. And that's primarily because the immune system has matured and other parts have stepped up to take on that role of maturing white blood cells. The lymph nodes are a small uh, round or oval structure located on the lymph vessels that we already talked about. And they're clustered in areas around the body, especially in the neck, the armpits, and the groin area. Uh, they're gonna contain lots of white blood cells and examine the lymph for possible pathogens. Each lymph node is surrounded by a capsule and then divided by uh, extensions of that capsule called trabeculae. Remember that means little beams, so these are little extensions. And they divide the lymph node into different areas. Each one of these areas has um, a geminal center that creates new lymphatic cells. Um, and then a cortex around it uh, that has lymphatic cells. So we have a bunch of different types of lymphocytes, um, each with a different function in the immune system. We're not going to go into those in this class, but in, you will go into these in physiology. So just know there are different kinds of these cells. Lymphocytes in particular are a type of white blood cell that are uh, made in these germinal centers, uh, and more of them are made in response to uh, presence of a pathogen in the body. Macrophages are really common within the lymph nodes and the nodules, like the, the um, tonsils and the malt. Uh, and they're going to engulf foreign uh, particles and break them down. The hilum is the indented area where the efferent uh, vessels leave the lymph nodes. And this is what it looks like on a microscope slide. And this is what a lymph node looks like uh, in an actual cadaver. So you can see the lymph, lymphatic vessels. This is muscle back here. Um, and then you can see uh, the, them going into and out of this lymph node here. And then on a microscope slide, you can see the medulla with those germ cells making new cells. And then uh, the cortex on the outside with lots of different cells being uh, doing their function. All right, your lymph nodes do swell in response to an infection. Swelling of the lymph nodes means that your body is fighting an infection. So if you ever have like, you feel like you maybe have a sore throat and you feel your lymph nodes in your throat, you feel your tonsils, like your doctor, like the doctor is doing here, and they feel a little bit swollen, that you, means that you're fighting off an infection. And they're doing that because within these areas, uh, new lymphatic cells are being made and they're going to go out and fight that infection. If your lymph nodes are swollen and tender and you have a sore throat, then you have a cold. If your lymph nodes are swollen and tender all over your body, if they're just in your throat, then you have a cold. If they're in your uh, armpits and um, groin as well, and you have a sore throat and you have a fever, then you probably have mononucleosis. Please stay home. Uh, if you have firm swollen lymph nodes that are not tender and you have cancer, then it probably it may mean that the cancer has spread to the lymph nodes. And that's definitely dangerous because then the cancer is growing in the place that's supposed to be fighting the cancer. Uh, metastatic cancer is where cancer cells from elsewhere in the body have traveled through the lymphatic system and then lodged in the lymph nodes and started to proliferate there. And of course, that is going to affect the ability of the lymph nodes to do their job. Uh, if you have cancer in the lymph nodes, that is called lymphoma. 
Uh, there are a couple different kinds, Hodgkin's and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Hodgkin's usually affects either very young adults or people over 60. Um, and it's distinguished by these double nucleated cells. Uh, Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is far more common. There are two kinds, some that are aggressive and fatal, uh, some that are very slow growing, respond to treatment, and are rarely fatal. So it really does def depend what kind of cancer you have. Uh, whether you have a good prognosis or a bad prognosis. There is hope, uh, so definitely um, that is something you need to see a doctor about. Now, going back to organs, uh, the spleen. Remember, spleen's main job is to recycle red blood cells, but it also has a lymphatic function. It is actually the largest of the lymphatic organs. It does have a hilum, which is this indented side where the blood vessels come and go, the splenic artery and the splenic vein. Um, it is located between the stomach and the diaphragm. So it's right up here on this, it like pushed up against the diaphragm, which is how you can distinguish it from the kidneys, which are more medial in the body, even though they kind of have similar shapes. The spleen is also has a capsule around it and it's divided into trabeculae of um, connective tissue, but it has this really distinctive uh, structure with these little areas um, with red pulp and white pulp. The white pulp uh, has arterial blood supply, um, lots, there's a central artery and then lots and lots of lymphatic cells around it. The red red pulp, or sorry, that's the white pulp here. The, um, the, sorry, this is the, I don't know what I'm gesturing to. This is the central artery and the white pulp around it with blood cells. The red pulp uh, has venous supply. So the uh, blood is gonna come in here and go out here. Um, and uh, this also has areas that store extra red blood cells. So if you can, if you zoom in on this, you can actually kind of see little red blood cells in here. Um, and your spleen has a really important function in storing extra blood uh, to be released when your body need, needs it. That may be during exercise when you need to actually um, increase the amount of blood circulating in the body so that you can increase the amount of blood going to the muscles. But also in response to trauma, uh, if you have a cut, especially a big cut and you're losing a lot of blood, your spleen is then going to re release more of those blood cells to um, help try to keep the blood pressure up. And then remember that the capillaries inside are sinusoids that um, where macrophages can very easily go into the lumen and red blood cells can leave the lumen of those cells, of those capillaries. And that is the end, and uh, stay tuned for the next chapter.